Our next guest is an anesthesiologist at the Royal Columbian Hospital in New Westminster, and he's done a lot of thinking about how we can be the healthiest society possible. Please welcome Dr. Suk Brar. My name is Dr. Suk Brar, and tonight I'll be your host, your anesthesiologist, and your navigator as we take a wild thousand year journey through the history of anesthesia and surgery around the world. My goal over the next seven or eight minutes <laughs> is to keep you awake unlike my day job. <laughs> now my professional, I had to have that joke in there. <laughs> now my, my professional travels have taken me all over the world and tonight as an honor to my mentors, I'd like to distill the knowledge of the best and brightest among us. And currently I'm working at the Royal Columbian Hospital, that little star there. Now, the Royal Columbian Hospital has stood on the banks of the mighty Fraser River for the past 150 years as the oldest hospital in Western Canada. Currently, the hospital serves a population of almost 2 million people, or one in three British Columbians, who count on the Royal Columbian for their critical care needs. It's truly the beacon on the hill. We're building the brand new, brand new hospital, the hospital of the future. By 2025, the new Royal Columbian Hospital redevelopment will be the most state-of-the-art cutting-edge hospital in Western Canada. Now, you can't see it there, but there's a DeLorean parked outside, and I'd like you to hop in, and we're going to take you on a wild ride about 3,000 years back, 88 miles an hour. Now, you can see here, it's a bit of a, a telling picture. Surgeons in ancient Egypt truly struggled providing surgical care without anesthesia. You can see assistants holding down that uh, poor patient. In ancient India, the, the Indian plastic surgeon Sushrata performed complex plastic surgery with his anesthetic being two people holding down the patient. In the Middle Ages, we see battlefield surgeons amputating limbs off of soldiers, and you can see the agony on that patient's face. Again and again, we see this visceral response, pain, suffering, and agony. Well, over the ages, shamans and medicine men tried any number of toxic plants, chemicals, and herbs to various effect, most famously the mandrake root whose screams, it was said in mythology, could anesthetize a man for up to six hours. And you may remember it from the Harry Potter series. <laughs> if you look at Paracelsus, let's move forward another 500 years. He was a bit of a quirky alchemist in the 15th century who took equal parts alcohol and sulfuric acid and synthesized ether. Now you'd think he would try this on humans, but curiously, he only experimented on chickens. And we'd have to wait another 250 years for the end of the Dark Ages, before Dr. Joseph Priestley synthesized nitrous oxide in 1773. Again, human experimentation was in laughing gas parties, or in this cheeky advertisement, Living Made Easy, a prescription for your scolding wife. <laughs> I have a girlfriend, but I'm currently not married. I may never be. Now, moving forward in our DeLorean to 1846, we see Dr. Crawford Long, a southern surgeon, of quite uh, fair renown, who in published in 1846 an account of using ether to amputate limbs and also do basic do, uh, removal of tumors. And he would charge 25 cents for the ether and $2 for the surgery. Not sure who would want to get that done for $2, $50 in today's dollars. It was truly in 1846, shortly after Dr. Long, that this gentleman, Dr. William Morton, synthesized or created the ether inhaler, which allowed for the first time a deliver or a predictable dose of anesthetic to be given to patients. And he uh, showed it initially in 1846 on October 18th at the Ether Dome in this very famous uh, or infamous day in, in our specialty where you can see him providing the anesthetic to the patient Abbott while Dr. Warren, a world famous surgeon at, at Masters General Hospital, removed a tumor from the patient's neck. A large audience, much as yourselves, was completely flabbergasted and news of this event quickly spread around the world. Today, you can also see the ether dome, where lectures are still held for medical students. We have the example of Dr. James Simpson, who famously anesthetized Queen Victoria for the birth of her eighth child, for labor and for delivery. So you can see how anesthesia is graining in fame and publicity over the last parts of the 1700s and into the 1800s. To summarize, we have chloroform, ether, and nitrous oxide that allowed anesthesiologists and surgeons to perform far more complex procedures between those two pictures here. Now, this is the early 20th century. But really, who are these masked men and women behind the drape? While 100 years may have passed between these two pictures, 
Anesthesiologists have always been at the cutting edge of patient safety and saving lives. Before our involvement, anesthesi before anesthesiologist involvement, CPR was performed from behind the patient. Not particularly effective. <laughs> Captain Obvious over here. It took the work of Dr. Peter Safer at Baltimore City Hospital in the 1940s and 50s. An amazing picture there in the middle. And he first came up with the principles of modern day CPR, allowing millions of lives to be saved. We had this amazing example of, of Dr. Virginia Apgar, who trained to be a surgeon at Columbia University, but the tyrant surgeon, Dr. Whipple, said, you cannot work here for you are a woman. So what did she do? Like any good woman, pulled the bootstraps up, created the first anesthesia training program in North America, went through the program, and became a specialist in taking care of newborn babies and expectant mothers and helping save thousands of lives. Now, some of you in the audience know what this is. This is an iron lung. It was used in the 1940s and 50s during the severe poliomyelitis epidemic that spread, the world, spread through the world. It was a difficult time for patients who had to sit in this contraption for hours at a time. My colleague, Dr. Bjorn Ibsen from Copenhagen in 1952 figured out, well, why don't we put a tube down the front of someone's throat and then have poor medical students inflate the bag there, as you can see, for 24 hours a day the entire summer. And this was the first steps to forming the current version of the intensive care units we see today. And it got the patients out of the iron lung. I was in an operating room like this earlier today, performing an eight, helping perform eight-hour surgery. And you can see the number of anesthesiologists and surgeons and nurses that are involved with the complex surgeries we do today. Truly, this environment can resemble the cockpit of an airplane. A lot of similarity, a lot of cross-training and cross-pollination between the two disciplines. This is a picture I took a few years ago of an operating room. And you can see here, there's up to 14 monitors that the anesthesiologist has to look at. And occasionally, something like this happens. Makes all of our hearts race. Anesthesiologists have been at the cutting edge of intensive care medicine as well. This is an ICU that I work in frequently. And with this work, we truly do help patients who are literally on the brink of life and death, walking the tightrope, so to speak. We've been at the forefront of patient safety with the creation of the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation in 1985, which helped revolutionize patient care and the safety of all of our patients. We took the risk of being awake during surgery, I'm sure a lot of you have that concern, to about the same risk of dying from a lightning strike. We took the risk of dying during a regular plain old anesthetic to about the same risk as dying during a plane crash. So you can see with the skill and training of someone like our friend Captain Sully, anesthesiologists can help you through critical situations. We're helping to miniaturize equipment that one time took up the size of a bed to the size of your briefcase. We're miniaturizing ventilators that would occupy a closet to the size of a laptop. We're bringing life-saving equipment into the operating room to provide the right treatment to the right patient at the right time, truly helping save lives. This is the stethoscope of today and tomorrow. We're using handheld ultrasounds to go to the wards and all over the hospital, including the battlefield, to diagnose and treat patients at the site of injury. Soon, you'll be able to plug this into your iPhone. Handheld wearable technology will allow anesthesiologists and surgeons to optimize patients before surgery, and then more importantly, monitor them for weeks, days, weeks, or months after the operation, optimizing their care. I'm convinced in the next five to 10 years of the advancement of brain technology that anesthesiology will help scientists and theologians unlock the mysteries of the mind as compared to our physical brain. We'll use virtual reality technology, such as the HoloLens 2, to help us plan and carry out complex surgeries. This is McDreamy, an infusion system for medications and anesthesia that you'll see in the next five to 10 years, moving towards robotic anesthesia and potentially one day having your entire surgery done by a robot. I'm fascinated by the idea of deep space voyages and one day some people in this room or their grandchildren may be anesthetized for days, weeks, months, or even years as we go to the stars. But let's come home to finish to this little blue marble that we call planet Earth because all change truly happens at the grassroots. Whether that's my father walking with the head schoolmaster at the school his father made in rural India in the 1950s to help take care of and educate the poor and impoverished children of North India. Legacy to me means the University of British Columbia partnering with the University of Washington and other partners to create the first residency training program in the history of Namibia. Inspirational work, truly. So 
I'm sure all of us feel, and I do very deeply, that we each must be the change we want to see in the world. And I'll finish with this slide. For all the change makers in the room that, like me, have at some point in their lives struggled with mental health, professional burnout, fatigue and distress, and maybe even despair, friends, remember to have the serenity to accept the things you cannot change, the courage to change the things that you can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>